How I long to breathe the air of heaven The pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And every prayer we prayed in desperation songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear and in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And on that day we join the And beside the heroes of the faith With one voice a thousand generations Sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain And, and on, on that day we, we join the resurrection, resurrection And stand beside the heroes With one voice, a thousand generations Sing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain Forever here He shall reign So let it be today We shout the hymn of heaven Angels and the saints, we raise a mighty roar. Glory to our God, who gave us life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord, so let it be today. We shout the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints. We raise a mighty roar, glory to our God, who gave his life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord, and holy, holy is the Lord, and holy. Thank you for that. What a, what a longing that creates in us, if it wasn't there before, for that day when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom forevermore, a kingdom which will have no death and 
There will be no pain and hurt and there won't be any prayer requests in the sense of praying for medical illnesses and which aren't an inconvenience it's really a blessing to minister to each other in that way that's a ministry that every Christian has is the ministry of intercessory prayer as our Savior is doing that for us right now and he doesn't stop I invite you, if you have a copy of God's Word, to turn with me to Psalm 119. We will be looking at verses 89 through 96 this morning. And as you see the picture, I I try to find a picture that kind of captures some of the text and the, the meaning, the thrust of the passage. And, you know, sometimes we live our lives not wanting to take the next step. We see obstacles and challenges, and we don't want to try. But then we have a brother or a sister or the Lord prompts us by his Holy Spirit to to take that step. It's going to be okay. You can do this with my help. And so you see this, presumably two boys trying to climb this, what looks to be a a mountain or a molehill, one of the two, but uh, you never know. But it's motivation for all of life, and I believe... The psalmist in today's passage turns to the Word of God to motivate him, to revive him, to save him, to lead him, because he is in a desert, he's abandoned, he's got these obstacles. At one point he had a teacher, but no longer, so he has to turn and resolve himself to rely upon the Word of God to guide and comfort. And so as we read God's Word publicly, if you are able, please stand Uh, for the public reading of God's Word. Now, again, if this is your first time with us, the Psalm 119 is 100, it's so beautiful. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. Lamed is this stanza of eight verses, and every verse begins with this Hebrew letter, Lamed, and this is how God's Word reads. Forever, O Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You established the earth and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. I am yours. Save me, for I sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. I shall diligently consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, meaning all of the things in this earth. There's a limit, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, again, we come to you just hopeful that one day we will hear the hymn of heaven. And this is with a hope that is found in the scriptures. It is a confident expectation, a hope that does not disappoint that one day we will Close our eyes in this earth, open them in the next life, and see you. So, Lord, be with us as we lack motivation sometimes in this life. I pray for the heavy-hearted. I pray for those who are still grieving. I pray for those who have difficult decisions to make in the days ahead, whether it's the care of parents and a possible move, whether it's... uh, Uh, making a logistical change, a decision for the future, college, job, Lord, preparing for a baby. There are many, many families represented here. And I just pray that you would encourage us all with, with and through your word and by your spirit today so that we can take the step to have a closer walk with you. Because regardless of any event we may face in this life, if you are there as the good shepherd to provide and to protect, to comfort and to counsel, then we could face anything. We thank you and praise you for this time, this moment now in all of human history where we have gathered to worship the God of the universe whose voice reaches a thousand generations. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. We praise you today and forevermore, O Jesus, Lamb of God. 
and it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. A proven motivator will make it to the top before a proven genius. Andrew Carnegie hired Charles Schwab to administer his steel empire. These are two names you're familiar with. Schwab became the first man in history to earn one million dollars a year while in someone else's employ. So as an employee, he was the first American to make a million dollars a year. I will tell you I'm not on that list, and that's okay. Schwab was asked once what equipped him to earn $3,000 a day. Was it the knowledge of steel that he possessed? No, Schwab said, that's nonsense. I have lots of men working for me who know more about steel than I do. Schwab was paid such, this, such a handsome amount because of his ability to inspire other people. And this is what he said. He said, I consider my ability to arouse enthusiasm the greatest asset I possess. Any leader who can do that can go almost anywhere and name almost any price. Motivation is absolutely critical for us as human beings. We are so discouraged so quickly because we have these expectations, we have dreams, we have opportunities, and sometimes obstacles, I would say oftentimes obstacles rear their ugly heads. Obstacles are simply opportunities for God to minister to us in a special way where otherwise we would just be coasting. Motivation, motivation. Sometimes with animals, you have the motivation in front of the animal to lead it and guide it to, to go where you want it to. I know my kids, whenever they want the cat to come in, <laughs> Rebecca's got the magic voice, and she's got the fancy feast cat food. Not salmon. The, the cat's allergic to that, and we certainly don't want our cat to be disgruntled but she motivates that cat with the fancy feast and I never thought as a man I would ever say those words together fancy feast it's about as bad as meow mix but anyway sometimes we motivate with the good things but sometimes with like a donkey that's not wanting to move you you crack the whip motivation we get discouraged so easily as a pastor that's probably my, my greatest struggle is because you pray and you seek the Lord and you hope and, and you see such great, incredible potential in the people of God. And then sin gets in the way. Obstacles rear their ugly heads. But I have learned that we are on a journey in its progress over perfection. One day we will be glorified as Christ himself has the glorified body. This psalm stanza that we just read ministered to me in such a great way, and I hope and pray that it does you uh, today as we consider just two points. And these are two points in which I could stake my life and ministry on. The surety of God's word, standing on God's word alone. The Bible stands like a rock undaunted is a good hymn of faith that we sing. And the supply from God's word. We look for supply as we've moved. We're in three different locations now, and it's nice because, you know, you just, I'm getting my steps in. And I need to, but where are the kids' clothes? We were going to bed last night. Where are the kids' clothes for church tomorrow? I don't know. They're either in a trailer or in a house, in a box, somewhere. You know, they just, just put something on it. I have clothes. Where? Put mine on them. Use trash bags. Not the transparent kinds. But the supply from God's word is, is there just as much, and we see it in this passage. The surety, we don't use that word too often, and so when we see verses 89 through 91, it speaks of the surety 
of God's word. Surety is, it's a sure thing. It's 100%. It's guaranteed. These companies that offer 100% guaranteed lifetime warranty, you realize it's only the lifetime of the company. So when I purchased all of my appliances from Bed Bath & Beyond, I suddenly had a punch in the gut a few months ago. Let's hope my blend tech doesn't die on me. Amen to that. The psalmist begins in verse 89. And this is such a beautiful thing, beautiful phrase in which he says, my soul, he says, uh, excuse me, he says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. So without a doubt, forever, not a partial time, not a thousand years, forever, your word is settled in heaven. This phrase, settled in heaven, your translation may say, firmly fixed, if you use the NIV translation, if you use the SIV, or the, the, uh, the ESV, it might say, stand firm. Your word stands firm or stands secure. The Hebrew word is not sob. And it has this idea of, of a firm, fixed foundation, which cannot be unsettled with weather, with, with time. Uh, it is settled. It is a settled matter. I remember arguing with my parents losing every time growing up and uh, and 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 they would end the, they they would say their statement and they said end of discussion it's settled and i said okay if you say so the word of god is settled we we have these debates in sports or in I don't know, the Harley-Davidson world, what's the, what's the best year and model of Harley ever created? Is that settled? I don't know. It's a, an opinion. Who's the greatest of all time basketball player? Is it Wilt Chamberlain? I would say P Pistol Pete has to, Maravich has to be in the conversation. Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant. Who's the greatest football player? It, it really doesn't matter. These are just sports matters. But it's unsettled. You know, court cases, thinking of, of criminal court cases, did, did that person really murder his wife or was he guilty or not guilty? It's not settled. God knows. But here we have this, this comfort in the scripture of the surety of God's word. I know when my expectations and dreams and opportunities that, that I have... They, they go unmet or, or dreams get shattered, really. I, I have this comfort and this confidence that, that I can go to God's word and it's going to be sure, it's going to be steadfast, it's going to be reliable, it's trustworthy, it's believable, it's given to us without error and flaw and every time. When I open God's word, I will not leave disappointed. In other words, it is settled in heaven. And whenever you have a court case and something is settled, there's, there's usually an attestation of facts. And God's word being settled is attested to by God's faithfulness, first off, and the finality of creation. If you look at verses 90 and 91, your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You establish the earth and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances for all things are your servants so god is is the top the top he's at the top of this 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 it's not a pyramid scheme i don't want to use that phraseology but there's no one above god and since god stands forever he's the same he's immutable he goes unchanged his 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 demands of the righteous law go they do not change they're not fluid the gifts that he offers us in and through jesus christ do not change also the the requirement of of faith and and accepting that gift they, they do not change for any generation just as god does not change so since god does not change his his word does not change god is god you are god alone there is no one like you that's that's not a debate. It's not up for debate. No one can come close to doing what God has done. I, re I remember when I went to seminary in 2005, I was attending this church, and this, the, the pastor had twins, and they were miracle babies. They're grown adult and, and men now, but they spent many months in, in NICU, and, and very tiny, and, and they were 
they were so creative. They, they were tiny their, their whole lives, really, but they're, they're, they're grown up now. But, uh, so, but they had a lot of spunk. And I was going to uh, worship there regularly, and, and he was sharing that uh, they were getting bullied for being pastor's kids and, and believing in creation and, and all of this, forgiveness in Christ and, and all of this. And so they were on the school bus, and, you know, most parents would be afraid of them getting eaten up for, eaten up for lunch and dinner by, these, by the world out them. But this one bully on the bus particularly said, you know, I'm, I'm bigger and more powerful than your God. And so the twins, they, they said, okay. And the next day they, they said, okay. Let's have a little contest to see if you're bigger than God. This bully was saying, I, you can't see your God, and, and I can hit you, and your God will do nothing about it. And so the boys, the boys brought a, a bag of dirt on the bus the next day, and they told this bully, he said, you, you're bigger and more powerful than our God, and so we're going to give you this dirt, and I want you to make a, a person with it. And they were in second, third grade saying this to the bully. And it shut his mouth up. There is no one like God. And since there is no one like God, there is nothing like God's word. And so we turn in our discouragement and when we lack motivation in life to make these decisions, whether it's to get rid of junk we don't need. My, my wife says, get rid of your junk. And I say, it's merchandise. It's valuable to someone. It was valuable to me when I was seven. So I got to keep it. We are in the process, and we're going to have back-to-back -back garage sales, raising money for missions, but we're going to get rid of my junk. We've already donated a lot, but, but God does not change, and his word does not change. So when we come to his word, there's, there's surety. We can take confidence. God's word has been attacked by every generation, questioning, undermining, ever since Satan in the Garden of Eden with Eve, he says, has God, has God certainly said you would die? Your word is settled in heaven. And in verse 90, the psalmist focuses on the faithfulness of God and how it continues through all generations. And so this, this concept, this, this idea we have is that God's faithfulness is observable. God's faithfulness is also impartial. What do I mean by this? God's faithfulness is observable. The Psalms were, were written as, as praises and worship songs. And God's faithfulness is highlighted. His covenant love and fidelity. He shows up. He's trustworthy. His word is, is always, he, he's true to his word, in other words. The psalmist certainly was thinking about as God's spirit was inspiring him to write this song in his very, very demotivated state of being. He looked back at Abraham and, and he said, well, God's been faithful to Abraham. He was an old man and his wife was beyond childbearing years. Yet God made a promise by his word. He made a covenant with Abraham and Isaac was born. He looked back and he saw Joseph. God was faithful to Joseph as, as being from that same lineage. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And his son Joseph was thrown in a pit, sold into slavery. He was accused falsely by Potiphar's wife. He was thrown in prison again. He was taken from the top, multicolored robe to the pit. The top to prison. Uh, and then he became the second most powerful man in Egypt and saved not only Egypt, but the Jewish nation as well. They increased in number in Egypt during that time. Surely the psalmist looked back and saw Rahab. This was a woman who was used and abused by the people around her, being a woman of ill repute. Yet God kept his promise when she hid those slaves. She put that scarlet red thread in her window. And when Jericho, when the walls came tumbling down, Rahab and her family were spared. God was faithful to keep his word. Ruth, God has been faithful to women like Hannah. Hannah prayed for a son and got Samuel and, and dedicated him to the Lord. Hannah prayed for more children and God honored that as well. So God is, and his faithfulness is observable. 
His faithfulness is observable in your life, just as it's observable in mine. God is faithful even when I have not been all the time. And I'm thankful for that. He doesn't change. That's who he is. It's what he's about. So this impartiality is, 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 is an, an extension of God's faithfulness. He is faithful to judge wickedness. And he is faithful to reward righteousness. What I mean by this is we see this injustice in life and it could really not motivate us to, to live as we ought. When we see wickedness rewarded, it, it demotivates us. When we see people at work or in school cheat to get ahead or to stab others in the back to get ahead for what, a dollar, it, it certainly doesn't motivate us to play by, the, play by a, a different set of rules. <laughs> but God is going to reward them with judgment just as he will reward us with an impartial reward if, if we walk in his ways. His, his word is, is faithful. It's observable and it is impartial. This phrase, this, his faithfulness is faithful to all generations. And what a comfort when we think of God's word. This is, this is an old collection of books. It may have been relevant 4,000 years ago, but... But it's not relevant to me is what the critic says. God's word is settled in heaven and it's, his faithfulness is to all generations. And so just as he was faithful 2,000 years ago to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, he is faithful in the year 2023 to meet our needs and to give us direction. All generations speaks of a forever type of reality. And that's how this stanza begins, forever, O Lord, forever and ever. We see this played out in uh, the book Lamentations, written by the weeping prophet, very familiar passage of scripture, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. Uh, Jeremiah, who was who, who is described as the weeping prophet because he, he was saddened by, by what was coming, the judgment coming to God's people. And this is what Jeremiah did. He says, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God's word is settled in heaven and it's settled on earth. It is sure. God's faithfulness is unending. It is forever and it is impartial and it is observable. So you have the faithfulness of God and the word of God just blending together in this beautiful mixture of mercy and grace to us. Undeserving. Isaiah 40 verse 7, the grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The word of the Lord endures forever. The surety of God's word. We see secondly in this psalm, in verses 92 through 96, we see the supply from God's word. Let me direct your attention to verse 92 because this includes a conditional statement. An if-then statement. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. The psalmist is not an idiot. He understands his predicament. And this is what he says, really. This is, this is my paraphrase, if you will. The psalmist says, If God's word becomes and remains my and your delight, then you will have victory. Notice those underlined words, if this is a reality in your life, then you will have victory. The what is very important, delighting in God's word in verse 92. It establishes this 
this precedence, this, this way of living. It's a lifestyle. It's not something you check in and check out of, but, but this desire is, is a good and a godly desire. And so it begs this question, what does it mean to delight in God's Word? Do I delight in God's Word? Am I experiencing victory in, in this realm of struggle and temptation? Do I feel defeated? Do I feel like I'm missing out or losing out? Am I delighting in God's Word? So it begs the question, what does it mean to delight in God's Word? We look at this, this word delight, and it means, in the, in the Hebrew, it means to desire, to delight, or to take pleasure in. We desire, and then we act on that desire, and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's a bad desire. And here in this case, it's one thing to have the desire, it's another to act on it. And so the psalmist, in, in terms of motivation, he is, he is coming to the point of decision. Delight must result in decision for any seeable and foreseeable benefit to accrue to you. So there is priority and there's pursuit here. We can desire something, but if we don't act on that desire, it won't become a reality. I could, I could desire food, but, but my sandwich isn't going to make itself. No one else will make it for, well. <laughs> I could desire to lose weight and, and to be healthy, but if I can't stop eating junk food, and if I don't exercise, if I don't act on that desire, it's just wishful thinking. Now, these are temporary matters, right? Whether it's a meal or a weight loss lifestyle change, how much more so should we act on good and godly desires? I'm afraid there have been many times in my life where God has, has given me this desire. He's, he's planted this desire, this, this seed in me, like, like you read of in Hind's feet in high places. He, he puts this seed within us, but, but then I, I don't act on that desire, and, and the desire becomes less and less. But, but sometimes I, I do act on those desires that he gives me, and and the desire and the hunger becomes more and more. And that's the very definition of desire is acting on it increases the hunger even more. The psalmist gives this conditional statement to you and he's really speaking about himself. If I delight, if I desire your word, if I actually care about what you have to say and want to hear and want to know and believe and act upon, if I, if I simply do this, then I will have victory. It's that simple. Who wants to experience defeat? So the psalmist goes on to say, in verse 93, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have reminded me, or revived me, rather. I will not forget, and so when we talk about forgetting stuff, I forget, I have so many conversations, and I'm, I get excited about them, especially when talking about ministry and the Word and how God is working, and I'll be talking with my wife, and I said, Bettina, you would never believe I was talking about this. I just learned this profound thought, and she's like, yes, Jason, I told that to you. And I said, okay, then you see what kind of an impact it had on me. It's really exciting. And, you know, it's coming back. It's a double blessing. So how do we not forget things? I have a verse pack that was given to me uh, with Bible verses that I'm memorizing. And this constant use, day in, day out, you review these verses because even verses you think you know well, you have to dust off, you have to sharpen and clean the, the sword every once in a while, the tools. So constant use and constant consideration is how, how we do not forget. When kids are growing up, they forget names, but, but they do not forget the names of people that are constantly around them. 
the psalmist sees the value in God's word because he says, I will never, I will never, ever forget in verse 30, uh, 93. So the psalmist sees value in God's word. And that's where desire and delight comes. There was a time when I looked at, at the word of God as just some exercise to cross off a list. And I do not like exercise. It was drudgery. But then I saw value in it as I struggled going through college with depression and, and identity and, and all of these things. And I, I turned to God's word for clarity and my confusion, my spiritual questions that I had. And he gave me the answers. So what is the value? Just in this psalm, in verse 92b, uh, we see that it protects. The word of God protected this man internally and externally. It revives, verse 93b, it leads to intimacy. Consider verse 94. This is a bold declaration. The psalmist says, I am yours. Save me, for I have sought your precepts. Now I want you, if you've trusted in Christ as your Savior, I want you to say that with me. 94a, say it with me right now. Speaking to God, I am yours. And you know what? God keeps his own. No one will snatch you out of the hand of God. If God could deal with the greatest threat to that relationship with himself by sending Jesus Christ to die in our sins, he could deal with all minor threats. Do you see value in the word of God? If not, this is how this stanza ends in verse 96. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. And this, this idea of an exceedingly broad, uh, this, his commandment, his word, God's word, it speaks of there's an endless supply. There's, there's no boundaries. There's no limits with God's word. If your struggle is future, God's word will have a solution for you, an answer. If you're struggling with finances, God's word will speak on your situation, perhaps a loss in the family, perhaps a temptation you're struggling with. Perhaps you're, you're struggling with, with motivation. You've tried everything. I was sharing with the guys yesterday as we were moving, or sometime I was sharing, as I said, you know, I was trying to watch a, a YouTube video or something, and, and this, this Marine, this Army veteran, came up with this invention where you hook this machine up to your, your belly, and you push a button, and the advertisement says it's like doing a thousand crunches in five minutes, and I said, I want that. A thousand crunches, I, I said, I could look pretty intimidating up here preaching sermons. It's all, it doesn't work. You can't bypass the exercise. But God's word is limitless. There is no limit with God's word. Think about that. Every category of life, whether it's the good times and you don't want to, to fall or whether it's a valley and you want to get up, God's word is there for you as we digest it day in and day out. The psalmist realizes, and, and you do too, we are just as human as he, that with human wisdom, human education, human innovation, human technology, medical advances, there's, there's limits with all of that. The seven wonders of the ancient world, we can't even hardly name them all, let alone visit them. Only a few are standing to this day. Isn't it innovative to think that 
you could create a vessel that could go to the depths uh, and see the Titanic in light of this tragedy that just took place. Something went wrong. There's limits to human technology. But with God and his word, there are no limits at all. We've observed his faithfulness in the past, and we can observe it now if we have eyes to see. The psalmist saw the supply from God's word. Here are some verses to consider in terms of the supply from God's word and desiring and delighting in it. Psalm 119, verse 103, which we will get to in a few weeks. How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. God's word is to be esteemed. Job, who went through such a horrible earthly experience. Job chapter 23, verse 12. Job says this, I have not departed from the command of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So Job says that. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 3, we are told you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord talking about the supply from God's word. It's sweet. It is to be esteemed more than even necessary food. And this was by a, a guy who, who went through horrible circumstances but did not curse God. And it's necessary. Man does not live on bread alone. The psalmist recognizes there are limits to what this world can give you, but there are no limits with what God can provide. So as we close, we, we think of this psalm, we think of how God's word motivates. And I just came up with three phrases from, from this psalm, and we can consider perhaps uh, Christianity has, has failed you. You've had a bad experience with fellow Christians, maybe ostracized, outcasted, judged, shamed, not given a chance. God's word is different, and I will tell you, this church is different. One, when God says something, when God says anything, it always comes to pass. How can God's word motivate you this morning? If we see it from God's word, plainly and simply, there's revival here. There's salvation here. There's hope here. There's, there's joy. There's love. We can have peace that passes human understanding. If God's if God says something, it always comes to pass. How often do we make promises or hear promises that, that never come to pass? When God speaks, he always keeps his promises. Secondly, not only whatever God says comes to pass, but whenever God speaks, he always keeps his promises. It may be in this life or, or in the life to come, but God always keeps his promise. And then lastly... This is the promise we have from God's word, considering this psalmist and this psalm this morning. Whoever comes hungry and humble will always leave filled and fortified. I know I have left meals hungry, and I start scavenging the house, whether it's cashews or Oreos, double stuff. Whenever we come to God with a hungry and humble attitude, he will always leave. We will always leave that filled and fortified. Hungry for more. God's word is settled in heaven, the psalmist says. And since it's settled in heaven, it's, it's harder to settle something in heaven than it is on earth. And since his word is settled in heaven, we can uh, deduce that it is also settled on earth. God's word is infinitely valuable. It's limitless, it's endless, it's boundless. It, there's no boundaries. His word is speaking now as we've considered this psalmist's stanza. 
So I ask you, what are the motivations in your life? What are your motivations, motivating factors and peoples? Why do you do what you do? Why do you get up? Why do you function? Are you motivated in life? Are you living for Jesus Christ and his glory this day and all of your days? Does the praise of men, does the praise of women, work colleagues, community members, neighbors, does their praise mean more to you than the praise from your heavenly Father? Perhaps worldly riches and pleasures spur you onward. We are working so hard and busying ourselves so much with hobbies that may satisfy us for a season but leave us empty in the end. Are we empty? Are we feeling unmotivated this morning? Is this describe your situation? I have a challenge for you. Would you commit to seriously considering and obeying God's word this morning? Whatever he's asking you to do, this isn't wishful thinking and this isn't just fleeting emotions and feelings, but would you commit to considering God's word so that if then statement that the psalmist said applied to him will apply to you. If I delight in your word, then I will never perish in my affliction. Perhaps you've committed to Christ and a recommitment is in your immediate future. Is God's word taken seriously by you? Is it delighted in by you? Do you desire it more than you desire a Snickers bar or a lunch after church on a Sunday morning? We do not pursue God to compare and to compete and to have answers for Sunday school and for small groups. That's not why we delight in God's word. We pursue and we prioritize everything around God and his word because it is in God in Christ that we become that which we're created to be and we find satisfaction in soul and in spirits and there are no others who can satisfy as God does and no others who can meet our needs like God does as he's promised in his word. Let us commit you will not regret. You will not, you will not have any uh, second guessing once you've tasted and seen. And you can relate to the psalmist when he says, your word is sweeter than honey. Like Job when he says, I, re I desire your, your word more than any necessary food. We do not live on bread alone. Let's make that commitment today as God's people, knowing that adversity will come. But our God will be there with us, and his word is settled in heaven and on earth. Let us pray together.